Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Ukraine and we're talking about an amazing new book that's called The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict Resolution. This book's author, Nikolai Petro, is professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island. He is, like most good people, a graduate of the University of Virginia here in Charlottesville, and he is a recipient of two Fulbright Awards, one to Russia, one to Ukraine. Nikolai Petro, welcome to Talk World Radio. Nice to be with you, David. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for writing this book. I highly recommend uh, that everyone get a copy and read the book. Uh, if you can summarize very briefly, I'm not sure how, how can Greek tragedy contribute to understanding what's happening in Ukraine? So when I went to Ukraine on my second Fulbright, it was the year 2013, 2014, a momentous year, which uh, allowed me to see the events that led up to the Maidan unfold, then uh, the overturning of the legitimate regime at that time, and the institution of the, of the, of the current uh, regime. And uh, during that year, I visited a lot of the country and began to, under, uh, began to appreciate the diversity within it, especially uh, the diversity between the far eastern regions of the country, which have been in rebellion uh, against the rest of Ukraine since 2014, the Donbass region, his, region historically known as Donbass, and the far western regions known in English as Galicia, but locally Halicina, uh, and the diversity between them, the differences between them, are currently expressed in things like language, religion, and cultural identity. And they have their origins in the fact that uh, these two regions were part of different empires. The Eastern region was part of the Russian empire. The Western regions were, uh, for a number of years, part of the Austro-Hungarian empire. And that has left a distinctive imprint on their local identities. When the nation state of Ukraine was formed after World War I, briefly, um, these two regions literally created their own distinct governments, which had to negotiate with each other and come to a, a an understanding that allowed that would allow them to create a unified nation. What they agreed to in uh, at the end of the uh, well, 1918, 1918, 1919, was to form a very loose confederation. Uh, the the uh, actual autonomies of their distinctive portions of what would subsequently be identified as the Ukrainian state would be something they left for later deliberation. They simply wanted uh, with the act of unity to uh, determine the parameters of the state and the fact that they all belong to it. Um, but who exactly would be in it and what their respective rights would be would be left for a later time. However, uh, World War, this was already after World War I, but the settlement of Versailles denied the Ukrainians and a, a nation state. And the people who, I should say, the government uh, that uh, created Ukraine, the Ukrainian uh, territory as distinct, uh, uh, was the Soviet Union. So Ukraine was created within uh, as part of the Soviet Union. And uh, later on, uh, in the aftermath of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, these Western regions were taken from Poland, which was created out of the Versailles Treaty. And therefore, it was basically a choice between Poland or Ukraine. And the Western powers decided to favor the creation of Poland. 
rather than the creation of Ukraine. And uh, out of that, uh, then subsequently came the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which transferred the western regions of Ukraine, or as the Poles call it, the eastern portions of Poland, out of Poland and into the Soviet Union, and but specifically Soviet Ukraine. So now the, the resulting nation state has a built-in tension. What uh, Vlad President, Russian President Vladimir Putin used to say uh, and still says about the Soviet Union was that it was created with a ticking time bomb in it. And one of those time bombs was in fact the creation of uh, the Ukrainian nation state. And we simply have a delayed uh, explosion of it right now. Uh, this is this is all very important for people to understand uh, who've started paying attention to Ukraine 11 months ago, uh, in particular. Um, what does it have to do with ancient Greece? Yes. So uh, one of the things I have long had difficulty understanding personally was nationalism and national hatred. And it's because I suspect I grew up in an emigre family that wandered through a lot of Europe <laughs> and lived in a lot of different countries, eventually came to the United States and obtained citizenship. But then we returned back to Europe where my father's uh, work was and they settled there. I then decided to make use of my uh, American citizenship, which had been pretty much up to the age of 18, a useless appendage for me. <laughs> and I decided to make use of it and come to the United States for study because that's a, it was a country I didn't know, essentially. And I decided it would be in, interesting and important for me to, to learn about it. And then I could make my decision whether to stay in the United States and live here if I liked it or go back to Europe and uh, use that uh, identity that I had and, and the comfort that I had there. Uh, speaking of the University of Virginia, why did I choose Charlottesville of all places to come to from Rome? Well, it was a simple matter. I simply looked on the map and said, what cities with universities are on a lateral with uh, Rome? So at least the, the one thing I could predict might be the weather, I thought. So Charlottesville, happened to be on that map uh, and not too far from, from Washington and an airport. At the time, I would say in the 1970s, you'll recall, uh, David, that uh, the university only admitted women uh, undergraduate in 1971. So it was not that long after that. It was really, I would say, not exactly a gentleman's club, but it, it was certainly a parochial institution, different from I would say the International Research University that it, it is now. So I think they were attracting people like me specifically to have multiple diverse components there that I could, could bring culturally. And uh, it proved out to be a, a fortuitous marriage for both of us because I then continued with my graduate studies at the university as well. So. Uh, getting back to your question, it's it's uh, very it's very interesting. I don't want too many tangents, but I, having grown up in Northern Virginia, I also yeah. moved to Charlottesville from Rome, having lived in in oh, Rome okay. for a while. But uh, twenty years twenty years later, I think it might yeah. have been. Uh, anyway, to to try to get so to Greece, ancient Greece. Yeah. So um, I have difficulty understanding uh, intense, long seated hatreds of other people. Immigrants can't afford that, <laughs> uh, but here we are. So we, we, I could see this situation. And these were, were people living in the same country, having the same citizenship. Why did they literally, and this is long before any military, why did they uh, shun, it, it, not necessarily explode in violence, although there, was, you know, there were a lot of rumblings, uh, as there were in Yugoslavia before the uh, tragic events there. But uh, what explains, or what, A, what explains that, and B, what could heal that? 
Well, I, I couldn't find a solution that would answer those, reconcile those two issues for me until I came across a book by Richard Ned Liebau, a retired a professor at Dartmouth, who wrote a book called The Tragic Vision of Politics. Now, the book is a bit of a misnomer because it describes what he calls a tragic vision of international politics uh, by using four case studies. And the first case, studies, case study is the Peloponnesian Wars and uh, Thucydides' interpretation of it. But along the way, he draws the theme through Morgenthau and Clausewitz uh, and two chapters on the Peloponnesian Wars that there is a consistency to um, uh, a philosophical approach to politics that he that stems from Greek tragedy. And he calls, in fact, Thucydides the last tragedian because he wrote at the end of this spectacular century, the fifth century BC, when when all of our contempt, all of the tragedies that have survived, only 33 out of more than a thousand that were written. We have only 33 left, but those were all written during the, the fifth century. Um, so his argument in a nutshell is that tragedy offers an appropriate understanding to politics that gives us a way to level the ups and downs uh, of conflict. Um, and it reminds us, the tragedy of politics, the tragic vision of politics, reminds us that there are no permanent solutions. And so I thought to, 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 to political issues. There are, however, ways to manage them and ways to reconcile hurt. So I thought, now there's something I could use. <laughs> to understand what was happening in Ukraine, because a lot of the discussions that I heard in Western Ukraine against why the Easterners were bad uh, citizens, being bad citizens and bad Ukrainians, and in the Eastern Ukraine, why the Westerners were crazy Ukrainians, not good people, uh, had to deal with what had been done to their grandparents or their parents or their great grandparents or somebody back there and, and why this could not be forgiven. And this again struck a chord with me because what was the Peloponnesian War but uh, a civil war among two people that if we think about it today, if Greeks think about it today, they're not gonna go, oh, you Spartans, you know, I remember what your great, 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 you know, grandfather, whatever, did to mine. It's just silly. We understand that now. But um, I guess two or three generations is not enough time for a lot of people. But the healing process that uh, Thucydides, uh, let's say, made reference to in the tragedies that had been written in the decades before he was writing his history and that informed his understanding of the conflict, um, most probably uh, notably the writings of Aeschylus, the, the uh, plays of Aeschylus and Euripides were, uh, uh, were full of uh, suggestions that I decided to explore more deeply. And when I started to, to explore Greek tragedy as a social phenomenon, I came to see that it performed, the performance of the tragedies, which were part of a annual festival in both Sparta, well, throughout the, Greek, throughout the Peloponnesians, uh, throughout the Greek peninsula. Um, were actually seen then as an essential aspect to democratic governance, along with pop popular representation 
there had to be a popular reflection done jointly with the whole community of what had occurred most recently in their history and it needed to be debated and it need to be needed to be shown to everybody again sort of like a you know like a television series that everybody talks about and it was fairly easy to do in in Greece because the entire um uh, politically active population could fit in the great amphitheaters. We estimate about 20,000 people. And literally that was expected of them. And there were three, four days of festivals, free food for everybody, lots of entertainment, debate, people coming into the cities and um, as well from the countryside. And and all of this was meant to be a catharsis for the population, a chance to explore deep emotions on things that perhaps individually they didn't feel comfortable talking about. But now that everybody could see it on the stage, they could say, yeah, you know, I felt bad when that happened. And somebody else would say, no, he, you know, good for him. They, he got what he deserved. And then somebody else would, from the audience would yell, would yell, you bastard, whatever, you know. Anyway, it was a raucous scene, but it was, as I said, cathartic. And it was meant to evoke these passions. And as I understand it, again, this is all a retelling from our uh, most, uh, scholar, the, the scholarly knowledge that we have about uh, Greek democracy and the role of tragedy in it. I just never heard this part of it uh, because we usually focus on the plays themselves rather than on, well, was the play for, meant to perform a social function? Did it, was it part of the political process? In this case, it's important, uh, or the thing that I highlight in the play is not so much the actual play's content, but its social function. What were the playwrights and the elders of the city trying to accomplish with these regular performances, which were annual for at least 60 years that we know of. And by the way, coincided with the institution of democratic governments and its end. Now, I can't say too much about that, but that's very provocative. It's provocative to think about why did it begin? Why was tragedy so important at the beginning of Greek democracy? And why, why did it collapse when, when tragedies stopped being performed? But the, the, so as I, as I highlight in my book in the first chapter, the performance of tragedy was meant to heal society. It was a social instrument to get people to confront what they didn't want to confront. And most specifically, to understand that their enemies were themselves. They were humans, just like us, or in this case, the Athenians were just like the Spartans. The Spartans were just like the Athenians. And we would never get to peace if we didn't start with that premise. The yeah. same has been true of every war in the past, in the present, and that we will have no doubt in the future. In the book, Nikolai Petro, you talk about the, these tragedies in, in Greek theater, in these amphitheaters, creating in the audience compassion and war opposition, a very different social function from, say, a sitcom, the function of which is to get you elected president of Ukraine, I guess. So the so how would you reproduce this in Ukraine? You're not going to put everybody in an amphitheater. You're going to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in at least two languages, numerous media channels. Uh, you're going to have that despite opposition from the United States and Russia. How, how, how do you do it? One of the objections to my highlighting the importance of tragedy and, and reminding people of it today, I that I anticipated was that people would say, well, there's nothing like the, Dion the Dionysia today that we can recreate. And I thought about that. And then uh, somehow I stumbled upon 
or remembered the, tra the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. So when I started to look into this, and thank you to my graduate students who I made write essays <laughs> about lots of different examples of the implementation of Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, I learned from them and from my own readings that they have been in existence, these Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, since the first one, Uganda in 1974. So that's about 50 years. And uh, that they have been active in about as many countries. So we have lots and lots of examples of an institution that was created after the fighting ends, because the war doesn't end when the fighting ends. The next day, you still hate. <laughs> so the solution is, after the fighting ends, to diminish the hate and transform the hatred that you have been told to feel. That was yesterday, it was still the noble sentiment the government told you. Today, they're saying something different. And you have to make that adjustment within yourself. And that's not going to be easy because you may have loved, lost loved ones, obviously. And uh, the easiest thing to do is to, at least hating, I guess, gives you continued rationale for existence. So you have to find a different rationale. It has to be provided for you. The government has to support that in principle and not feel it's just something that they're forced to do, but are willing to, to encourage. And out of this acceptance and process, eventually come new political leaders who can begin to talk a political language of reconciliation, which was impossible to talk during wartime. But that has to be, without that, there is no foundation to politics at all. What I'm saying is, when there's war, there's war. But when there's no war, there has to be political discourse. If you continue the war, then you there's never any political discourse. You eventually just consume yourself into nothing. You disappear as a nation. If you continue to war, have, have fighting all the time. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the important thing to remember here <clears throat> is that <clears throat> there are as many different manifestations and examples of this as you can imagine. And sometimes they occur, they, they uh, are constituted from the outside and brought into the country. Sometimes they are, they are constructed from within the country. Sometimes those countries have been in civil war. Sometimes those countries have been in civil wars in which other countries have been massively involved. One of the examples I go through in some detail is Guatemala, which uh, uh, suffered through 34 years of civil war, mostly with the support of the United States. The United States was actively involved in <clears throat> encouraging uh, the government to suppress that civil war, and they never got around to it, and eventually everybody just, just gave up, essentially. Um, and uh, so out of this, all I can say is there are many, many different examples to look at. And uh, the next generation of Ukrainian leaders, whoever they are, will most likely be doing that. Because if they don't, then they will have no country to salvage. So, so these deep-rooted problems, uh, divisions that could have been addressed at any time in the past decades, uh, it, it could be addressed if the fighting were to end. But we're now in a period of, of sheer madness uh, where the problems yeah. well, cannot be addressed. Is that the accurate the, understanding of your view? I think uh, I quote a line from Euripides, who, who savagely mocked. The Peloponnesian War. I mean, he was the great playwright of the war and and mocked it mercilessly, mercilessly and said, you know, if uh, if we could see the consequences of war, the, the war that we are being asked to join, uh, the, he's talking about the Phoebean 
emissary who comes to say, join us in our righteous cause. And, and, and you know, the, 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 one of the other messengers is kind of giving an aside to the audience saying, if we could, you know, if, if, these, if these kings and princes could see the consequences of what they were doing, we wouldn't all be, Greece would not be languishing in war madness right now, he said. And that's, yeah, war is madness, clearly. Um, but it's not going to end. Or it's through. really, you know, I got, I'm a reader at, at our church, and one of the prayers that I read at the end of, of the service goes into, we, uh, one thing um, I, we pray for is a release from the slavery of our own reasoning. That's what war is. It's a good reason to hate. Now, ask yourself about that phrase. <laughs> is there ever really a good reason to hate? Of and you, and you think about it in normal terms, you say no. But we come up with all, or our politicians come up with all sorts of reasons why we should be hating. I even read op-eds in the Washington Post about how oh, Russian culture, yeah, I used to love Russian culture, et cetera, but I can't now. You know, what does that have to do with? Yeah. It's culture. It's not war is not culture. War is the opposite of culture. It's the anti-culture. Nick, we have about two minutes left. And I, <laughs> I'm just Sorry. I'm a little I'm a little distressed because we can't use all of this brilliant knowledge and wisdom to address these problems until the war is over. But the, well, war the Guatemalan going... War during the Guatemalan War it began during the it was part of the peace negotiation. And we had we have seen something like that. Let, let's not remember, let's not forget. The Minsk Accords were supposed to be a mechanism for both reconciliation, Minsk II, the Minsk II process, a reconciliation and a reintegration. The it, it failed with the reintegration of those portions of Ukraine because they never got even to begin the reconciliation process. Mm -mm. So what? So in in a minute or less, how do we get something started in the right direction? the The question becomes properly: When do people? When do nations get tired of war? They do get tired of war, but exactly what leads them to be exhausted? about that particular war differs. Like, even if we look at just the American wars that we're familiar with. So Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. So long-term military engagements. And at some point, the military leader who was going, yeah, 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 just went and say, ah, and that's it. And everybody basically in the rest of the country breathes a sigh of relief. Okay, what I'm not sure what what emotion leads to that point, and what we as the as individuals I like I like your motto you know politics as if people mattered <sighs> hard well, some some you know to quote George or paraphrase Orwell some people matter more than others. <laughs> And we really have to figure out what is going on in the mind of our political leaders, our, I mean, broadly speaking, all the political leaders, and try to turn on a switch there to say, okay, you know, this is not going to work. When are you going to acknowledge the fact that it's not going to work? Excellent question to be continued. We've been speaking with Nikolai Petro. The book that you need to read is called The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict Resolution. Uh, Nikolai Petro, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. My pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.